Welcome, everybody, to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindi, the publisher and editor of the Fretboard Journal magazine. Thank you to everybody who left me feedback, sent me notes, sent me emails regarding our last episode featuring TJ Thompson and Mark Stutman. There were so many guitar insights in that one episode. It's kind of mind boggling and so many of you enjoyed it. We'll keep getting them back on the podcast. We'll keep having them come to the Fretboard Summit. Don't worry. I'm just glad that all of you enjoyed that episode. Listen to it if you haven't yet, folks. That one was was pretty mind boggling. Today on the show, I am talking to someone who I think might have my dream job, but I'm going to keep my jealousy at bay. Richard Walter of MIM, the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. MIM is this state-of-the-art, gorgeous museum dedicated to all things musical instruments, not just Western, you know, Jimi Hendrix smashed this guitar kind of instruments, but instruments from around the world. It's like nothing else around, and Rich is the senior curator. He gets to decide which instruments the museum obtains, which ones they borrow from famous musicians, how they're going to be documented and exhibited, and so much more. We also talk about how he's able to preserve these instruments and some of the rules of thumb he follows when it comes to climate control. It's a great talk. It's an incredible story. And the best news of all is MIM and the Fretboard Journal are going to be partnering on some exciting stuff for the next year or so. I'm excited about that. And they have a new exhibit called Acoustic America, Iconic Guitars, Mandolins, and Banjos. If you are a Fretboard Journal podcast listener or reader, this exhibit is right up your alley. And it starts November 10th, 2023 and goes all the way through September 15th, 2024. They've got Mississippi John Hurt's Guild on display, Earl Scruggs' banjo, Elizabeth Cotton's guitar, and so much more. Our dear friend David Grisman lent them some mandolins that we talk about during this chat. It's a staggering array. I'm super excited to see it firsthand. And I want to plant this seed. We are plotting a fretboard journal meetup at MIM during this exhibition. Rich is offering fretboard journal podcast listeners and readers a private tour of sorts. He's going to show us his favorite things. It's going to be fun to geek out with him on the exhibit. We've been tossing around some ideas on timing. It might be February 18th, 2024 to match the 100th birthday of some of those iconic Lloyd Lore signed Gibson F5 mandolins. We don't know, but drop me a line, podcast at fretboardjournal.com. I'll let you know what we come up with, whether you live in the Phoenix area or can make the trek out there, it would be great to see you all. Fretboard Journal meetups tend to be super cool. This will be no exception. Our podcast is brought to you today by our friends at Stringjoy Strings. We have a discount code in our show notes for their amazing products. We are also brought to you by Peghead Nation where you can learn from the likes of Matt Munisteri and Mike Compton and Joe K. Walsh and Mark Goldenberg and so many other great players all online. There's a discount code in our show notes for them. We're also brought to you by Seattle's Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar, who not only have a stellar selection of vintage instruments, acoustic and electric, but they also have an incredible repair center, like seven full-time techs fixing acoustics, electrics, amps, rare effects, you name it. Check out their offerings. We're also brought to you today by Native Instruments and Isotope, both of whom are offering you all some cool discount codes. So go to those show notes to unlock those. We have a new issue coming out. It's our 53rd edition. I've been working like crazy on this one. Lots of historic guitars that we tell the story on, as well as one heck of an interview that I was lucky enough to do with Ben Harper, plus so much more. 128 pages, as always. We've never shrunk our magazine. So it's always 128 pages. It is such a cool, keepsake, coffee table style magazine. I hope you will check it out. Subscribe at fretboardjournal.com. Last but not least, we have a Patreon for this show. I'm going to include a link in the show notes and you can get the podcast ad free along with some bonus content. Best of all, you'll be supporting me and everything that I do and our little team here in Seattle, Washington does. Without further ado, here is my talk with Rich Walter of Phoenix's Musical Instrument Museum. Richard Walter, welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. Well, it's a delight to be with you. You and I have connected over the years on various projects. We've talked about stuff happening at the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix. But uh, before we get into that and your chapter there and what you've been working on, give us a little history about yourself, because to many of us, it seems like you've got the greatest job ever. (laughs) You get to go cherry pick these amazing instruments and showcase them every every, with every exhibit. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I feel very, very fortunate. Um, MIM is a, a truly unique place. And the capsule comment uh, about myself, you know, I, I have a, a background in anthropology and archaeology. That's what I studied in college. I've always really liked material culture. You know, I liked matchbox cars and Legos and and things that had details. And 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 I guess even in that respect, always um, had a little bit of a, a gene for for collecting things or knowing which things. I liked or which things were were exciting. And that certainly has has been helpful or been an ingredient of what I do here. Um, so after anthropology and archaeology, I, I got a degree in folklore and ethnomusicology because I was going to college in Rockbridge County, Virginia, where there was some really extraordinary music going on. I'd never been exposed to people playing bluegrass music or acoustic music or, or really live music in their homes in in the way that people were doing all around that area of Virginia. And it was really fascinating to me and certainly not unique in the world. I just didn't happen to grow up with it. So it was a real eye opener for me. And then I learned there was a thing called ethnomusicology where you can, you know, pursue that as a real earnest interest, you know, how people make music important to their lives and how that expresses itself. And so I, I did that and got really lucky that the timing lined up. There was a job opening out here at the Musical Instrument Museum that was appropriate to, to my background. And I was living in southern Indiana. I was going to school uh, at Indiana University and teaching at Butler and working at a wonderful audio archive on the campus of Indiana University, um, but, but was offered the position here in the curatorial department. And a couple of weeks later, I was living in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, didn't didn't hesitate. That's incredible. So when they brought you on, how much of a instrument gear history fanatic were you? I, well, I was a I had my own private fanaticism, I guess. Um, and so I, I, I play a little bit of music. And so I had a banjo that I really loved and had learned how to play mandolin and um, started learning some guitar chords uh, in high school, but never really took it seriously until again, I was exposed to, to flat picking musicians around Rockbridge County, Virginia, a guy named Larry Keel in particular. And then a lot of wonderful local players, Randall Ray, who actually builds Rockbridge guitars now, uh, Bird Dats. I mean, there's a whole community around there who, who just blew my mind and were really generous and, and talented. And so I got into it more and more and was surrounded by people who who played music at a real high level. Danny Nicely, great mandolin player and guitarist. Uh, so I got really spoiled. You know, I accidentally found myself in a place where the people were so good that I really wanted to, to learn how to be some kind of part of it. So I, I had a little bit of history at, in uh, appreciating these instruments and, and finding a couple that I enjoyed playing for myself, but but nothing on the magnitude of of being in a global collection and and starting to to have some responsibility for for growing and 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 shaping what what a museum collection could like look like with the help of a, a whole curatorial staff and an exhibits team and uh, a lot of people who work here. Yeah. And how established was the Musical Instrument Museum when they brought you on? I came out in late 2014, almost exactly nine years ago, um, but we opened in 2010 to the public. Mm -hmm. And then in a couple of years prior to that, there'd been a, a huge amount of, of effort going into, uh, you know, accumulating the collection, getting it ready to open to the public in 2010. And so in that sense, Certainly the facility was established, the mission was established, and the, the premise of representing authentic musical instruments from every part of the world was in place. And there was a real critical mass of a collection, thousands of instruments. And then since I've been here, uh, you know, it's been a process of refining that, that vision and going back through the collection constantly and looking for, for real specific opportunities to enhance the collection, find uniquely, you know, special instruments from again, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
and that's an ongoing process, you know, again, with a, a team of curators and, and wonderful registrars who help the practicalities of getting things here physically from from all parts of the world. Uh, so it's a big team effort. Um, but the mission was well established right from the get go. And there's just been an ongoing process of of continuing to refine the collection and present it in the galleries in ways that we're more and more proud of. Yeah. You guys have this state of the art, I mean, beautiful facility. And even in the two decades I've been working on the Fretboard Journal, like I've seen some museums come and go and some museums celebrating fretted instruments pivot and change. Um, it's not easy running a sustainable museum. What was the history of the Musical Instrument Museum and, and who started it and, and what is the mission statement of it or or what is it now, I guess, is a yeah. question. Yeah. The, the founder of the museum is a gentleman named Bob Ulrich, and um, he had previously been the CEO and chairman of the board of the Target Corporation. Mm -hmm. And so he, he actually brought this incredible retail mind and, and a vision for a museum. He, he had a real a real appreciation for how music as an art, as an expressive art, really touched on people's sentiments and emotions. And he and a, a dear friend of his, who is an African art expert named Mark Felix, um, were, were discussing this and they both appreciate cultures from around the world and art from around the world, but realized that music taps into something that that virtually everyone can relate to and, and has an experience with and, and has nostalgia and taste and all that for. And, um, and they realized what really didn't exist anywhere was one place where it wasn't just Western classical instruments. It wasn't just, you know, fabulous grand pianos and Stradivarius violins, you know, something where really the, the on the ground music from all over could be portrayed with real musical instruments that in and of themselves would be really thought provoking for people who, who hadn't seen things from the other part of the world, um, separated by oceans, separated by generations and, and centuries. And so that was the vision was, was to have something that would be filled with real objects they were artful and, and compelling and beautiful, but they're also functional. They're musical. And by virtue of being musical, they're going to have some relation to anyone who sees them, you know, some some way of connecting. And then uh, with the video monitors that, that are throughout the museum, you know, people are, are watching and hearing and experiencing this music as they're seeing the instruments. But the mission is, is effectively... Uh, to present musical instruments from all the world's cultures and do that in a way that's inviting to a public audience. So it's not just to hoard and collect instruments, it's to have really fine representative examples for a public audience to come and see and discover and enjoy in, in one space where they can really travel the world of music and, and see how that, you know, uh, connects people from, from everywhere. And and as a senior curator, I think most of us, you know, we follow certain individuals on Instagram or YouTube and we see these guitar safaris and people going to, you know, open dusty old barns and look for these rare instruments or wheeling and dealing with the high end dealers. How much of your job is actually going out and reaching out and trying to obtain instruments versus sort of the the more academic minutia of I've got to catalog this, we've got to file this. We've got to restore this. Like, talk to me about what a day in the life of you, your job is like. Well, that's where we're, we're really fortunate, again, to have a, a fantastic staff of, of specialized professional people. And so in some organizations, you know, the person called a curator would be in the lab studying and doing forensic research and, and cataloging and doing all those things. We actually get to to split that work across a lot of people. We have registrars that help with the database. We have a really extraordinary conservator who does the hands-on uh, maintenance type of, of work, making sure the objects are, are structurally sound. It's not really, MIM as an institution is not meant for a lot of the, the academic minutia, frankly, because we also don't ultimately present that to our audiences. We don't have 
dissertations of information. There are thousands of instruments here, over 300 exhibits, uh, you know, over 14 hours of, of video content for people to see. And so each individual object, we love knowing about them, of course. So, so we do research them and, and know why they're here and what they represent. But we can't even present a lot of exhaustive information. So we don't spend a lot of time on any given object, hours and hours, weeks and weeks. Uh, so a lot of it is involved uh, with reaching out into the world, trying to pay attention to what exists outside of our collection and whether or not there are opportunities to bring important things into MIMS collection. Sometimes that takes the form of, of actual acquisitions, purchases, but we have a lot of relationships with, with lenders, with collectors, uh, with people who've been excited to donate museum, you know, instruments to the museum because they've recognized that MIM represents a particular environment and a particular audience and a particular attitude towards showcasing these things. They're not just going into a catacomb somewhere. They're really meant to be on public view. And so we've had wonderful opportunities with people who have really historic things, really special things. And they've decided, uh, given a variety of, of options and alternatives, that MIM feels like a really comfortable place and exciting place for them to, to co contribute things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of that, you know, that a lot of the time is spent on the curatorial department seeking out the, the objects, the instruments, the content, and working with our designers to figure out how to get that in the eyes of the public rather than squirreling it away and using it for, for kind of private research purposes. It's really, there are too many moving parts and, and too many fast expectations here to really indulge in that one by one, I'm going to sit down for weeks with a microscope kind of thing. Um, and, and again, we're lucky that we have other people here who who help us gather that information with the ways the instruments are handled along the way. Yeah. You have, you have a huge museum and the facility is just world-class and, and meant, for, you know, was built for this. I once toured what was at the time, the experience music project now Mo pop here in Seattle. And I got to go to their archives, which was off site, and, you know, far more expansive than what was actually on display. Is that what happens at MIM as well? There's a whole bunch of instruments that might get uh, brought out for certain exhibits, but otherwise are, are hidden away or is everything kind of on display? Well, there, there are a number of things in storage. Again, we're, we're lucky the, the whole facility was purpose built. And so the storage is here on site. Um, at any given time, I don't know the exact numbers, but call it four to 5,000 instruments on display. And I think the, the whole collection might be closer to around 10,000. Again, those are real rough numbers, but um, a solid half and more of the collection is always going to be on display. But then we do have objects in storage that are great for us to go back and, and help rotate exhibits. Uh, we can change the themes in any given exhibit if if we need to. Uh, we have extra examples. We can sort of change the calibration of, of what's on view. But ideally, uh, again, as part of the, the real premise and mission of the museum, the, the really important things, the real gems, ideally are, are meant to be out in the galleries for people to see them. Uh, we don't like to have the great stuff in hiding. And so it's really a, a, a place that is designed to have the good stuff, the historic things, the one of a kind, rare pieces, beautiful things out on display. Uh, so we do have a lot of also great things in storage, but, but we really do prioritize having the important things out on view. Yeah. And, and as a curator of a, a, a well-funded museum, does it matter to you whether you permanently acquire a, a rare piece of music, musical instrument history versus getting it on loan? Does, does it, do you favor one over the other? That's a, a great question. And, and interestingly, um, we love having things in the permanent collection. It gives stability. It gives real longevity to having some, some iconic things here, but because it's really meant 
for the public, we equally love having things on loan. And there are a lot of objects out there that are part of other established collections around the world. They deserve to be with uh, the museums or the families or the estates of the people who already own them. And if they're willing to, to share them with MIM for a while, we're thrilled for that. And we don't feel we need to own everything. We just really love the opportunity to display it here and to host it for a while. And we've been so lucky um, and really grateful that people have had extraordinary things on loan. And, and that's just as exciting for us because it fills the galleries and people come through the door and still get to see them. Um, so yeah, we, we don't need to own them, but we love working with people who, who recognize how MIM operates, how things will be presented and, and feel comfortable that, that they'd enjoy sharing what they have with a place that caters to that specific interest. Yeah. And that's going to lead to uh, the exhibit that you guys have opening here very, very soon. Uh, one more question, though. How often do these instruments get played once they are, once they land at MIM? Yeah, honestly, um, they get played infrequently, but but also we, we do keep an eye out for special opportunities. And, and we know they're musical instruments. We know that they're designed to be used, you know, but once they're in this museum environment, we take quite seriously that uh, we have an obligation to preserve them, too. So we work really carefully with our conservator. We're, we're really cautious about any of those opportunities. But for instance, uh, you know, last year, one of the instruments that's on loan here actually is Charlie Christian's guitar, his ES-250 Gibson. And we don't own it, uh, but the owner is really generous and, and really realistic about the idea that it's exciting for it to be played. And Julian Lodge played it for part of a concert in our theater last year, and it was really exciting. Uh, more recently, we had acquired a piano that originally belonged to Pannonica de Koningsvarder, so the, the jazz baroness yeah. and Thelonious Monk selected that piano from the Steinway showroom, a really, really cool piano, basically the piano that lived in Pannonica's home for decades. So, you know, Thelonious Monk and, I mean, a who's who of, of great piano players uh, all would have played it. And it's now in Mim's collection. And there was a concert where the fabulous piano player, Jason Moran, uh, played it on stage, you know, and so people could actually hear it and experience it before it went up on display. And so we do look for those opportunities. And then with special exhibitions in particular, when we have chances to invite really qualified expert players uh, and we have a chance to prepare some of the instruments for their experience of them. Uh, we love having a camera rolling and, and seeing the reactions and, and the impressions of world-class musicians using and experiencing some of these instruments. And then it adds to some of how we can present them in an exhibition context. It's a long way of, of saying not often do we do that, but we recognize the value certainly and when the circumstances align, it's really exciting for us to match up uh, a, a really historic, important instrument with a qualified expert who can help shed light on it with us. And, and we get to experience kind of through those hands, those, those insights, why some of these objects are extra important. So cool. Is there, is there video footage of Julian playing the, the Christian guitar? There is. Yeah, there's a clip. Uh, he was playing seven come 11 with his trio and it's just outrageous. I mean, it's, it was just, it was an awesome moment. And um, yeah, you, you can find it. You can go on YouTube. I think it's on MIM's YouTube channel. Uh, I think Julian posted it as well, but if you type in MIM, yeah. uh, Julian Lodge, Charlie Christian, it'll, it'll probably come up and it's just, it's a wild performance. Yeah. And and this is probably a good time to interject that uh, you guys are in Phoenix. Winter is about to hit most of North America. You guys throw great concerts. I mean, we're going to talk about this exhibit you have coming up here. Yeah. But you guys have world-class concerts happening pretty regularly. 
Yeah, I mean, it's we get so spoiled and it's easy to brag about it. the theater hosts, I think, in the neighborhood of 300 shows a year. So it's a really active theater calendar, an amazing theater crew. And um, it, yeah, we get totally spoiled. I mean, totally spoiled by great music. The room sounds wonderful. Just fried last Friday night. Bill Frizzell was here. Uh-huh. And man, it's just another reminder what a what a genius Bill Frizzell is, you know, and what a treat it is to see a solo show uh, with him. And several weeks before that, Borelli Legrand and Martin Taylor were here playing together on stage. Um, yeah, anyone who lives within any reasonable, even a couple hours radius of MIM should pay pay attention to our website and the theater calendar because there are some really knockout concerts that happen all year long. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking for those of us who need to escape winter, come to yeah. Phoenix is pretty easy to fly into. But yeah, yeah, I know when it comes to museums, when it comes to anything academic, there's a lot of planning. You know, the thing that launches this month has been getting worked on for years. We're here to talk about the Acoustic America exhibit, which opens November 10th and goes for yeah. basically most of 2024. When did the kernel of that idea hit you and and how did it come together and what was the original idea? And let's talk about it. Yeah, well, there are a couple of versions of that and and some of them are just uh, real indulgences. The kernel of it started years ago in, in Virginia when a buddy of mine had a copy of the Tone Poems record, yeah. Grisman and Tony Rice. I'd never heard of it. it. It actually had come out somewhat recently. He said, I think you might dig this and I listened to it. I thought, man, what is this music? This is amazing. And it just so happened uh, that that same place is where I, I heard people for real playing guitars and mandolins and banjos. So that's the way, way back kernel, like really in the back of my mind in terms of having a huge appreciation and kind of a debt of gratitude to David Grisman and Doc Watson and, and so many of these Clarence White, all these people who, who set that tone in my head. Um, for the Acoustic America exhibit that we're, we're launching in November, um, David Grisman had played here several years ago with his trio, with his son and Danny Barnes. And I'd seen him a number of times over the years, but that was an opportunity to see him here and, and maybe even subliminally plant the seed that it'd be really exciting to maybe someday represent some of his music in some format here at MIM. Um, these special exhibitions that happen in, in a space we call the Target Gallery, that's the main kind of signature gallery that changes each year. They rotate themes around the world. It's been Central African mask traditions, ancient Chinese instruments, all kinds of things. And so we were rotating through themes and um, I'd reached back out to David Grisman and really proposed a, a more substantial idea knowing that his collection is outrageous Mm -hmm. and that his music is really important. And if he might be willing to consider something, it would be an amazing core to a a concept because he represents not only just a, a stretch of time, but a really pivotal, influential artist and someone who has access to some really special musical instruments, the the tangible instruments that we always need to display at at MIM. And and he was willing to consider it. And we we started exchanging some ideas and he was very generous in providing some lists, you know, some potential lists of, of neat things from his collection to consider. And then I started reaching out to other people to see how that might, um, all combine or or complement. And before long, you know, we were speaking with people like Allison Brown and uh, Mark O'Connor, who'd been a lender here in the past already. John Oates, who 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 owned Mississippi John Hurt's guitar that he played at Newport Folk Festival. And so all these, uh, you know, kind of kindred people Slowly but surely, we were able to contact them and propose the idea. And and some of them worked out and some of them didn't. But we ended up with a real critical mass of, of, to me, extraordinarily exciting things. And in some cases, um, people even volunteered. Oh, well, if you're working on that, 
you might not even know that I've got this, but hey, you might be interested and you think, holy cow, you know, this is just awesome. Um, so it really it began with David Grisman and and then a lot of wonderful people have have gotten on board with the idea and been willing to loan some extraordinary things. And along the way, MIM, um, as part of our ongoing acquisition process, we've been able to acquire a few things that fit into that same story of Acoustic America, really important mandolins, banjos, guitars, ukuleles, steel guitars. Uh, so our own collection, the museum's collection, has a lot of really significant pieces that we'll be able to present in a different light in this particular gallery. And then they'll be joined by, by a lot of really, you know, again, uh, just really exciting loans that go back to Civil War era, uh, early, early instruments from early Martins and the Ashburn guitars, uh, homemade folk instruments, just all, all kinds of things that so we can talk about. <laughs> I could ramble and ramble and ramble, but but that's sort of the 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 concept. And we've been at it for a number of months, certainly in earnest, to pull these things together. Um, and all the lenders, including a lot of very busy touring artists and and people who have quite busy and complicated lives, have all been so cooperative to 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 pull together their their own energies and and help us out and make sure everything got here on time and and could all happen in terms of filling this target gallery with uh gems of the world of american acoustic instruments how many how many actual instruments did you cram in there <laughs> yes there are going to be 90 so 90 instruments and what's really exciting uh you know the title is acoustic america iconic guitars mandolins and banjos that's just kind of the, the capsule comment there are more than just that um but that's sort of the world we're operating in and um it'll be a full full gallery so 90 objects and what i love about it is given that they're kind of basic categories and fairly familiar objects, honestly, you know, guitars, banjos, people generally know what an ukulele looks like. Um, but every one of them is different. And, and I really love the fact that it is a reflection of, of people. Just the whole museum is designed to reflect human beings through musical instruments. And in this case, every banjo is different. Every guitar has a separate personality. Every you know, every mandolin is a really distinctive version. So we don't just have a lot of duplicates and redundant things. Every single object in there stands as a, a, a personality, has a real characteristic, a real identity. And I think that's hopefully going to be fun for people to see, oh, I, you know, I know what a guitar looks like, but I didn't realize it could look like all these different things. I didn't know a mandolin could look like all these different things. And then to associate those instruments with equally unique human beings who played them, who made them, who made them famous in their own lives. Um, I mean, it's just, it's going to be killer. You, you've mentioned Grisman uh, and, and he, like you said, had a museum's worth of instruments at his home already yeah. or wherever he keeps them. Uh, and and then you mentioned Mississippi John Hurt. Who are some of the other? What what are some of the other iconic? Oh my God! I've heard this instrument so many times. Uh, pieces that are going to be on display. Yeah. So um, the 1935 Martin D28 that Elizabeth Cotton used to record Freight Train. You know, I mean, you think of Freight Train and what a resonance that has had. And this is the guitar that she recorded it originally it belonged to mike seeger and so even that like the layering of so many of these instruments is is really cool so mike seeger owned this incredible guitar elizabeth cotton borrowed it for the recording session recorded freight train um and, and now it's owned by peter mclaughlin who won the winfield you know flat picking championship with the same guitar so these single instruments have multiple lifetimes worth of, of importance um you know jethro burns first gibson mandolin gus cannon's banjo um 
I mean, it's all, it's almost kind of gets my head spinning. Freddie Green's Gretsch Archtop guitar that he played with the Count Basie Orchestra for decades. So this is the guitar that Freddie Green played, and you can still see the string action that's kind of infamous from from Freddie Green's playing style. Um, you know, D David Grisman's Fern, the 1925 Fern F5 that was part of the original quintet record, and he played it with Stefan Grappelli and, and everyone else. Mark O'Connor's fiddle that, that he debuted uh, on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry. Jerry Douglas's Dobro, Alvino Ray's first uh, acoustic steel guitar. I mean, it really, it, without going through a list of 90 things, every one of them is a highlight. And, and it's, I kind of get going because they're, they're all in there for a reason. You know, there, there's just not a, a soft spot in the gallery. Everything in there is, is really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen pictures. It's staggering. Yeah, the, the viral video that Jake Shimabukuro in 2006, you know, while my guitar gently weeps, one of the first YouTube viral videos, yeah. we have that instrument that he was playing in that video. Um, so just things that some go way back in history and some are more contemporary, but they each represent by design, you know, these stages of acoustic America being a real vibrant part of, of our lives. Yeah. Uh, off the top of your head, is that is that uh, Kamaka ukulele? I think it was a Kamaka, right? Yeah, correct. Is that like the most recent instrument, m most contemporary instrument on display? No, oddly enough, um, I think you had just spoken with George Grun. the the <laughs> most The most recent instrument, which is also really cool, is a prototype of George Grun's new Versatar guitar. Yeah. And so one of the sub themes of, of this Acoustic America is looking at a kind of a history of interesting designs also. I mean, so going back to Lloyd Lohr and families of his instruments, um, you know, some novel experiments from the Gibson Company, some really interesting line and Healy mandolin and just different designs right up to the actual present moment of George Grun. Um, being really proud and excited about a, a new design of his guitar that he's putting into the hands of people just as of the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, so we've got one of the early prototypes of George Groon's brand new guitar. And that's that's the most <laughs> that that's, recent. Yeah, <laughs> that's as recent as it can get. Did George uh, loan anything else from his incredible collection? He did. Um, and so from George, we're totally grateful. Um, so in addition to this new guitar of his, uh, we've got Uncle Dave Macon's banjo and John Hartford's banjo, which is a really uh, heavy thing. So it's the A.A. A. Farland banjo of John Hartford's that is pictured, if you can visualize uh, the great Jim McGuire portraits, the, the Nashville portrait series that he did. And so this is that really iconic picture of John Hartford from 1972, the Jim McGuire photograph, and he's holding holding this A.A. A. Farland open back banjo, and um, and that's that's the banjo we've got here at MEM. Let me let me ask you a, a philosophical question, which I've been curious about, which is you you get these instruments and they're not all going to get played, but they're probably also in varying degrees of playability. Yeah. How much do you as the curator do to make them look like at least maybe they could be playable versus leaving those strings on? Because Charlie Christian might have played on those strings. Like walk me through that whole thought process, because it, sometimes I imagine you get banjos and the skin's torn and they're totally yeah. not playable and it looks glaring. I mean, what what do you do? Yeah, well, and, and that, that's another great question. And in a situation like this, it's actually part of the the selection process, honestly, so that we're not faced with a lot of those dilemmas where something might be really historic or, or uh, valuable for other reasons, but it's also not quite ready to be presentable. And especially if they're loans, uh, it's difficult for us to want to meddle in that process or that history. And so in the gallery, what people will see are playable instruments strung up, um, but not at full tension. 
And so some of them in particular, they're, they're still pretty fragile or they have special concerns. Um, and so we're really mindful to keep kind of a, a gentle but real string tension on them and to have them strung up and effectively playable. Um, but yeah, in the broader picture of MIM, you know, that's a, a consideration for our conservator in particular who balances that idea of making it complete. If a skin head is torn, how do we repair it? Do we have the proper type of material that would be truly local to, to how it would have been originally made? Can we reasonably make it a complete instrument? So we we certainly want to display things as if they are whole and complete and playable and functional. And that's a big, uh, it's an important parameter for how we collect things and acquire things is ideally we don't have things that that, were, that need a lot of completion, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that they're, they're basically intact and ready to go. And so for someone like, especially the, the touring artists, you know, and their personal instruments, they've been willing to loan. Uh, in a lot of cases, these things are road worn, you know, working instruments. And so they're, they're pretty ready to go, you know, and, and they've had string tension. They've been used, they've been played. Um, Alison Brown's Stelling Staghorn banjo, you know, the thing's built like a tank. It's an incredibly well-built instrument. So it doesn't have full tension on it. Uh, we don't want things to just be static under, under tension, but, but yeah, it's, it's totally rock solid. You you must get into weird predicaments though, where it's like, oh, this is a six six string guitar, but it only has five strings. But they were played by John Lennon or Jerry Garcia or something. Yeah. Do we add the six string just to make it look the way it would have back in the day? I'm, I'm sure you encounter those things. Yeah, we do, and ideally we do. And um, you know, and things like Charlie Christian's guitar, honestly, in that case. Uh, it, it's had plenty of string changes since Charlie played it. Sure. And so if someone, you know, when, when Julian Lodge played it, it had a brand fresh set of strings because that helps it shine that, that casts it in its best light. Uh, yeah. There, there are situations where a, a string breaks or something happens. And we also have a, a stash of old strings or period correct strings and, our lab has a lot of period correct and region correct materials that help us make those choices and help us, us make those decisions and complete that work in a, in a mindful way. Mm -hmm. You're, you are a, a musician and, and you, you get to live and breathe these old instruments day in and day out. Were there a couple instruments that just, when you open the case, exuded some sort of unique energy that really just knocked you out. Maybe they weren't even famous, but you were like, wow, this is history. Well, a lot of them do. And again, you know, I could just sort of start rambling and I know that's not the the point. Um, Roger Simonoff brought to the museum and we're lucky to be the caretakers now of Lloyd Lohr's personal F5 mandolin. And so talk about something that just has an aura and has a, a gravity to it. You open that case, um, that, that's a real heavyweight kind of situation where you just think, man, this is, this is a legend. You know, this is almost a myth, you know. Um, so to have Lloyd Lohr's personal F5 mandolin staring uh, right in front of you is, is pretty heavy. Um, we have a really early D18 guitar, a 1933 D18, so 12 fret slot head, you know, and that was another one where um, when we opened it, it had a real gravity to it, thinking this is the, the beginning of something that is almost so ever present and so classic and, and such the quintessential thing that you you lose sight that it ever wasn't there, you know, and, but then you, you look at a real early one and think, man, this is the start of, of a, an amazing story uh, that people are still aspiring to play a, a Martin D 18. And, and you're looking at 
a, a real, real early uh, kind of the, the dawning of of that story. So things like that definitely have that that gravity. Uh, quite a number of David Grisman's, honestly, and that that goes back to some personal uh, association with his music. Thinking, wow, you know, I've listened to these records hundreds of times, and there's this own grand artist that was on the record, or there's that blonde F4 from from Tone Poems. There's the real thing, and it's almost eerie. Um, and then you realize it's not eerie at all because it's is um instrument and david grisman is a a guy who is a you know human being who plays wonderful music and is thoughtful and generous like all these other people and so that's been the it's that interesting push and pull between these things having like magical qualities but then always remembering the reason they're magical is they were in the hands of regular people who did some extraordinary things with them and it's a very grounding thing to think yeah this is something that got passed around and strung up and tuned up and, and taken to festivals and, and played. Uh, and that's a really, it's just a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm realizing as you talk, like we're talking about well-known musicians like David Grisman and Allison, you must have this incredible secret directory of, I know a person who has this instrument and one day we may need to borrow it. <laughs> Do you have a little black book of of all these cool instruments that you may or may not one day need? Well, we again, we've been really lucky. MIM as a museum, as you might imagine, over, over the years has also sort of turned into a magnet for people who who are interested in special musical instruments. And so sometimes we reach out and seek people and try to reach them. And in other cases, they find us. And and volunteer a lot of really fascinating information and say, you know, we we saw your museum, we saw it online, we visited. Um, let me tell you about something I have, and and that's just a total delight. You know, when, when people are willing to share that information with us, and um, you know, in a lot of cases, the theater itself, the the live theater here is its own magnet. So a lot of performers from all over the world come through. And when they have a chance to see the rest of the museum and understand what the collection is and represents, a lot of times they think, wow, um, that reminds me, I have something that maybe you guys would be interested in someday. So yeah, there are a lot of those conversations and and there is uh, some version of a little black book and, and certainly a mental little black book where a lot of conversations and a lot of uh, ear catching details that we try to pay attention to. And, and then sometimes it works out. Then when we reach back out, the, the circumstances align and, and, and it can happen. And, and that's this acoustic America project has been a, a remarkable situation in that regard. A lot of the people there, are, you know, about 30 lenders and donors and, and contributors of things that all, um, cooperated, you know, with, with a timeline that was fairly, fairly quick when it's all said and done. And, um, so to gather that, that many different people together on the same page for the same purpose, I think speaks a lot to how, how excited they have been and proud to, to be able to show parts of their collections and parts of their careers shoulder to shoulder in a lot of cases with, with their own influences, you know, and, and it's so, Again, that, that's what's so so neat to me is the gallery is is sort of going to be this miraculous reunion of of musical souls, past, present, um, where there are lineages in every direction. Whether it's just the instruments themselves passing through different hands, or people who have recorded the music of each other or collaborated or, or crossed paths in a lot of exciting ways. And, and now their instruments are, are gathered in, in one place. And it feels like there's that, that reunion kind of energy. Yeah. I imagine, you know, sequencing, arranging, whatever it's called, deciding what's next to what in each cabinet must be one of the more fun parts of your job, getting to, to kind of program that, that uh, storyline. It, it is. And it's also fun, 
getting to work with our designers. So, you know, we, we share the work in a lot of different ways. So we've got these two wonderful gallery designers named Shelby and Lila and amazing exhibits team and mount makers who custom fabricate every mount that holds each instrument in just a particular way. And so working together with, with that whole team and visualizing how these instruments will be placed and distributed uh, it is a lot of fun. And it's been especially fun um, you know, th these names and, and storylines have not been especially well known to all the people working on the project. But then as we go, it's been so cool to, to have conversations and hear a designer say, actually, what we're really thinking of having a space where, you know, it seems like we've got a bunch of people who are stars of the Grand Ole Opry. How about we use that as a theme and get those instruments kind of close together or it looks like there are some really great arch top guitars does it make sense to have those as a little family you know those little conversations as they start stemming from more and more people makes it feel like the information and the the characters do kind of make a difference they do land in new people's ears and imaginations and they start uh, configuring themselves into blocks of narrative that that make more and more sense. So not not just from kind of the the nerdy curator, but everyone involved starts thinking. Actually, hey, this is going to work really well together. These instruments deserve to be shown in a certain angle, a certain position. Let's make sure this stands by itself. Let's make sure these are adjacent to each other. And it really is a cooperative effort, and it's it's great fun to to see that materialize the gallery right now the walls are up the paint is going on installations will begin next week um and that's when it really starts feeling like the fantasy turns into a reality when you see the instruments in that space so uh that's going to be just a, another exciting step you guys i mean beyond this target gallery which we're talking about you have this like you said all encompassing every musical instruments from around the world different centuries it's incredible when it comes to fretted instruments like what we're talking about with the fretboard journal celebrates yeah you're in phoenix that's a harsh climate is there a specific humidity and temperature you try to keep these instruments at you have a state-of-the-art facility i'm sure you could dial it in as close as or as exacting as you want yeah that's another great question it's a real practical one so uh yes we, we keep it hovering around 50% relative humidity. So, you know, between 45 to 55 uh, and as close to 50 as possible. And then right around 70, 72 degrees Fahrenheit inside the building, it is a harsh climate. So once you step outside, it's, it's dry and hot and, and uh, not very forgiving, but inside the walls, that's also where we're really so lucky that the building was designed with this purpose in mind. So the whole climate control uh, system is really sophisticated and, and it's extraordinarily important for it to maintain that stable environment. Because it's, it's also interesting, you know, it's not just the, the strict uh, humidity or temperature, it's the fluctuations. It's how how much that pendulum swings that can really be destructive to instruments going through cycles of expansion and contraction. So that's really what we try to, to keep things, uh, that pendulum swinging as narrowly as possible and right around those ideal parameters. And, and fortunately, it, it's worked real well. Yeah. I, I'm sure a tour of your uh, humidification system would be amazing for the, the guitar nerds out there just to see what state of the art looks like. Well, yeah, our, our, again, we've got a whole facilities team and, and they stay on top of this building staying healthy. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, the exhibit runs November 10th to September 15th, I believe. We're going to be celebrating it a lot on fretboardjournal.com because it's super cool and, and talking to you probably more. When it comes to these shows, you guys, like you said, are doing like almost a, a concert a day, it seems like. Do you think about the concert program? Does, does this exhibit lead to specific concert programming to celebrate it? 
Yeah, ideally it will. And we've got a great uh, artistic director and, you know, because that horizon through September still has plenty of time, but he already has some really cool things on the calendar. Uh, November 10th, that opening day, as it turns out, John Oates is going to be here performing in the theater. Um you know, John Jorgensen is going to be here not too long from now in the spring. Daryl Scott is coming. I'm really excited for Daryl to come out. He's such an extraordinary performer and he's got several instruments in the exhibition. Um, Sam Grisman and his band, the Sam Grisman Project, are going to be here. Peter Rowan is, is scheduled next spring. So, yeah, there are some really terrific concerts that align really closely with the, the narrative in the exhibition, in addition to all the other concert programming, but it'll be fun. And I really hope that those artists, when they are here for their, their concert dates, will have time between sound check and dinner or whatever it is to, to take a step into the gallery, because in a lot of cases, they'll, they'll literally sort of be uh, seeing some old friends. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do a, a fretboard journal gathering at MIM at some point. I would love it. Okay. Yeah. If, if anybody out there wants to have Rich give us a tour of MIM, maybe in January, February, March 2024, while this thing is sort of in the middle, uh, reach out to me, podcast at fretboardjournal.com. And also, I guess if anybody out there is secretly holding on to some incredible historic instrument, yeah. they should be reaching out to you, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, by all means, we, we love knowing people who have special things. And um, this particular project was was such a great opportunity to to thematize this this cluster of, of instruments. But but yeah, we we um, we cast a real wide net, you know, literally global. And so uh, whether it's woodwind, brass, keyboards, certainly these fretted instruments that um, that your audiences are so familiar with and so much really more expert than I am. People are passionate about this stuff. And that's the the joy too of, of the learning process. If ever there'd be a, a fretboard kind of event here, I think it'd be a just a heyday because we'd all get to learn from each other. People are passionate about this stuff and everyone has a different perspective or different experiences or has squirreled away some little bit of information or an instrument that that tells a story and and it's fun for that to to uh kind of gather upon itself yeah well let's make that happen folks reach out to me we'll, we'll i'll talk to you rich offline and we'll we'll come up with a few possible dates for that i know you haven't even popped open the champagne to celebrate the opening of this incredible exhibit do you already have the next one figured out in your head or thought about on a whiteboard well, you know, we, we're all thinking about those things. And again, we've got a whole curatorial team. And so this particular one was um, one that, that I was really proud and am really proud to be part of. And then other curators are, are working on other themes that, that pull from different parts of the world. So we certainly have some ideas in the hopper. And um, in the meantime, we're excited for this next one to open yeah. and working hard behind the scenes on, on the subsequent ones. So cool. Again, the uh, the f the exhibit is called Acoustic America. It's starting November 10th. MIM is an incredible facility in Phoenix, Arizona that everybody listening to this should check out at some point. Uh, and thank you so much for talking to us. This is so fun. Oh my gosh, Jason, it's it's totally a pleasure. We're flattered to to have a chance to talk with you. I Fretboard Journal is the greatest, you know, and and it really is such a a gift to to the you know guitar, mandolin, banjo to the fretboard community. It's it's an incredible, incredible thing that you've created. And so to have a chance to talk with you is is it's it's sort of like getting a chance to see these instruments up in close um, you know, after reading Fretboard Journal for so long to get to discuss it directly with you. It's, it's really a treat. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I'm flattered. Uh, and, and maybe at our next fretboard summit, we need to have you do a little tell all of what it's like to be a curator at a museum. <laughs> well, I, I've just given the, the brief version, but, um, <laughs> You no, know, it's great. And we hope everyone listening, you know, definitely Mim has cool stuff all the time, but yeah. if you're interested in, in these particular things, this is, 
a, a pretty intense, a pretty intense dose of of these incredible historic instruments. Yeah, you, you had me when uh, I, I in maybe one of your email signatures or something. There was an Earl Scruggs uh, gold plated banjo, and I was like, "That is yeah. that. Where else are you going to see that?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, how could, I didn't even mention you know Earl Scruggs Granada uh, is here, uh, an older Granada actually, not not the one in the Country Music Hall of Fame, but a 1928 archtop Granada that he had for 50 years in his home and uh, engraved all over the place. Just cool stuff. So I, I won't get ramped up again, but <laughs> we hope to see people out here because there's a lot to see, a lot to really freak out on. Yeah, I can't wait to see it myself. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Jason. All right, that was my talk with Rich Walter. I hope you enjoyed it. I uh, can't wait to get to Phoenix and I hope to see some of you whenever we get this Frickboard Journal meetup thing going. And as always, if you like the podcast, if you enjoy these interviews week after week with people you're probably not going to hear about in any other media outlet, we have a Patreon. You can also just leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. It's a great way to show your love for the podcast and tell others that it's worth tuning into. We have more great episodes on the way. So thank you for tuning in. Till next time.